Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 13th edition of Candrium's ESG Talks. My name is Marie Nimchik. I'm head of ESG Client Portfolio Management at Candrium, and I will be your host today. As you may know, Candrium's ESG talk series brings together eminent experts from a variety of fields to share unique insights on key issues in sustainability. And today we'll be discussing the roles of dialogue, of voting and of divestment. We will ask the question of how investors can effectively act on pressing sustainability issues, such as the climate crisis, for example. Should they divest, should they engage, or should they do both? On this question, we'll hear three different but very complementary perspectives. First, the asset owner perspective with Pierre de Vichy. Pierre, you are head of responsible investment at ERAF, the additional pension scheme for the French public service. We also have the pleasure of welcoming Jeanne Martin, head of the banking program at Share Action. Hi, everyone. I'm Jeanne. As Marie said, I'm head of banking program here at Share Action. Um, we are a UK-based responsible investment charity that campaigns to reform the financial system. And here in my team, we engage with Europe's largest 25 banks on the contents of their climate strategies. We engage with them on a bilateral basis, but also um, through their shareholder base. So we've had the pleasure to work with Candrum on a number of engagements. My name is Sophie Deleuze. I'm leading the engagement and voting team uh, at, uh, at Candrium. So at Candrium, we've been managing assets sustainably for, for over 25 years now. And of course, um, engagement, voting, and dialogue is a, is a critical component of that. And, and you're leading that team. So again, apologies to everyone for these slight technical, uh, technical difficulties, but it's so good to have the three of you um, with us today. And again, um, good morning to everyone in the audience as well. I want to start off with the debate around engagement versus divestment. And Jeanne, let me turn to you. Um, what's in your experience, um, what's your view on, on these two strategies? Are they complementary tools or standalone strategies? And what kind of trends do you observe on how asset owners and investors, um, managers are using these tools? Do you see attitudes and practices evolving? Uh, thanks, Mary. That's a great question. Um, our position here at Share Action is that engagement and divestment go hand in hand. Engagement cannot be credible if investors aren't willing to walk away at some point, um, if the company fails to respond or is unwilling to engage with its investors. But divestment also cannot solve every ill. Um, in terms of the trends that we've identified, uh, one of the things that we do here at Share Action is that every two to three years, we publish an assessment of the responsible investment policies of the world's largest asset managers. The last one that we published was in 2023, and it was an update on a previous survey that we had conducted in, in 2020. And it was quite interesting to see some of the things that had evolved in those three years. Uh, for example, the fact that asset managers uh, have civic significantly strengthened their stewardship and governance policies. So for example, three times as many asset managers um, now reported uh, that their boards had responsibility for the oversight of responsible investment policies. And more than 80% now have voting policies in place that concern climate change and social issues, although biodiversity still lags behind. However, the problem is that most of these improvements related to transparency or general policies. And while these are a strong foundation, obviously you do need the board to kind of own the responsible investment strategy, they must translate into the necessary action. And thinking about engagement versus divestment, what we found is that the majority of asset managers had escalation steps in their policies for, engage, for engaging with the companies that they hold and invest in, um, but over half did not include consequences for unsuccessful engagements, such as divestment, but also um, other strategies such as downgrading in internal ratings. Additionally, asset managers often shied away from measures which bring the most attention, including co-filing shareholder resolutions or writing public statements. So just to illustrate that with a few numbers, we found that only a third of asset managers reported to having asked a question at an annual general meeting, 
no asset manager in the Asia Pacific region reported that they had filed or co-filed a resolution on a responsible investment related issue, whereas three reported to have done so in the US and 15 in Europe. And finally, only a handful of asset managers in our sample provided evidence that they made their voting intentions public before AGMs. That's problematic because these actions can be the most impactful, but they're clearly being underused. So that really needs to change. Thank you so much. And thanks so much, too, for, for those figures that really um, allow us to get a much more concrete and tangible picture of what's currently happening. I actually want to turn to you, Pierre, and, and get your perspective. So the concrete perspective from an institutional investor. How do you approach the tools of voting, dialogue, divestment? For you, has it been a binary choice between either divestment exclusions or engagement, or are they part of a holistic strategy? Yes, thank you, Marie, and hi, everyone. Um, yes, I think I think for for an institutional asset manager uh, investor, um, it is part of a broader um, uh, picture and a broader strategy. Um, so I think, first of all, perhaps just to, to set the context is that there are several reasons that can lead to to exclusions. Um, be it either incompatibility of values between the activity and the uh, investor, it can be to protect one's image, or it can be to drive um, changes. Um, but in in all the cases, uh, I think we view it as uh, one brick of a, of a broader um, uh, strategy. And for instance, for us, and, and here we, we will be talking uh, about climate uh, a bit later on, um, really it is part of uh, stewardship. So first of all, it starts uh, even before before that with you know scoring and selecting obviously the investments as as everybody does, um, and then engaging with the companies. And then in certain cases, uh, exclusion can can play a role. And I think that uh, for, there, there can be several reasons leading to it. So I've mentioned either really the incompatibility of of uh, activities, but when we are thinking about driving changes, it can be. For instance, when there is no other alternatives uh, for, for the for the company. For instance, if I'm thinking of tobacco, um, you can engage the tobacco company. They will not start to do something else. Um, or it can be also when, uh, as Jen started to mention, on when the, the unwillingness to change from the company. So perhaps as a second stage after a failed um, engagement, uh, perhaps with the company. And I think that's that's interesting. We can come back to, to that uh, later. But um, uh, as, as, as a general rule, uh, we, we see divestment as a piece and probably coming after uh, other actions uh, have been taken. Yes, thank you so much for that practical insight. So we've heard from um, Jeanne about the importance um, of uh, having critical impact by associating um, concrete measures, voting, um, dialogue, but then also having the, the recourse of divesting if something doesn't work or progress isn't fast enough. We've heard your perspective of integrating this into a holistic strategy that actually starts pre-investment. So if you, I now want to turn to you and ask you about the nuances between different types of investments. So you practice um, engagement on a daily basis and you engage with companies that are part of very sustainable um, portfolios uh, with advanced sustainable approaches, but then also with companies that are part of portfolios that have less advanced sustainability approaches. What is your view in terms of the role um, of engagement in these kinds of different um, scenarios, in these kinds of different investment strategies? Is engagement something that's useful only in highly sustainable um, um, investment strategies or is there also an important role um, maybe with those issuers that still have a lot of progress to make in terms of their transition? Thank you, Mary. Um, yes, indeed, it's not a black and white story. So um, our engagement policy applies across uh, the wide range of uh, Canvium portfolio, including mandates, uh, dedicated funds. But uh, while as uh, explained, Pierre, we want to be partner of the transition if we focus on uh, climate uh, topics. Uh, if at some points, after having used uh, all the toolbox escalation measures, engagement uh, is, uh, yeah, is, is failing, it does not mean that from one day to another, we will completely divest at Candrium from, from the company. It means that first, 
the company will probably turn non-eligible to uh, fund uh, where we, we have put really strict sustainable investment criteria. And it means also at the same time that then we will keep some leverage on the company. We, will, we, we stay in, invested in the company across other type of funds, which enable us to still vote, to still co-file resolutions, to still put some statement at, at the AGM if needed, if escalation is needed, and is probably needed if the engagement has fail, failed in the in first instance. Um, but um, I think, and just, just to come back on, uh, on what has been said so far, indeed, engagement is preferred. Uh, divest, divestor is occasionally uh, needed. But when we look at, at, uh, at the company as responsible investors, we also look at the company in its globality. When engaging on climate, it does not mean that uh, we, we don't uh, look at uh, the, the company in, um, in all its, uh, in, in its complexity. And we perfectly know that behind the company, there are employees. There are also local communities uh, uh, that depend on this company. And that's why engagement is so important because we want to be partner and to go uh, uh, to accompany the, the, the corporate in their transition. But of course, in exchange, we want some guarantees that in this journey, we, we, we are on the right path. And also what I wanted to, to mention, because I think it's also about uh, the elephant in the room, is that uh, you, you are talking engagement for sustainable funds uh, today. Uh, if you look at uh, SFDRA regulation, Article 9, for instance, but also SRI label in, in, in Europe, it's sometimes very difficult to have uh, fossil fuel companies, for instance, in Article 9, or to have uh, these uh, fossil fuel companies in, um, in SRI uh, labeled fund. Um, so, Indeed, we will engage uh, sometimes with non-sustainable branded uh, uh, funds. And another aspect also to take into account is that uh, for our institutional uh, client, they give us the mandate to, to, to act. They give also some specification for, for their mandate. And sometimes because of reputational uh, risk that they don't want to, to, to face, they may choose uh, not to have also these uh, fossil fuel companies, because I'm focusing here on, on, on climate, because in, indeed, uh, the, all these funds that, uh, that we are managed are under scrutiny of uh, other uh, uh, stakeholders. And that's also something to, to take into account. Thank you so much. Um, so we've heard a lot about um, engagements uh, potential impact, but we've also spoken about uh, potential failure in terms of getting results and escalation methods. I want to turn a little bit to key success factors in engagement. Um, Jeanne, at ShareAction, you've witnessed many engagement programs. Um, looking back on your experience, what do you think are some of the key success factors for dialogue and voting campaigns? And also, how about the difference between collaborative and direct engagement? How do you select one of the two strategies? Yeah, great. Well, I guess the first thing to say is that shareholder engagement can definitely be an extremely powerful tool. But as you say, to yield results, it has to be used smartly and strategically. The reality is that investors have limited engagement bandwidth, which means they cannot engage the same way with all of their company, company holdings. So with that in mind, prioritization is key. And I'm going to walk through some of the questions um, that we think investors should consider before commencing an engagement with a company. Firstly, is the company the right target? And is the issue you're willing, you want to engage with them the right one? Does this company have the ability to shift the market? Or is it one that you have significant shareholding in and therefore your opportunity to influence them is greater? Secondly, what is the company's shareholder structure? If they have a majority owner, such as a state or a family or an individual, what are the real chances of success? As I said before, shareholders need to be ready to exit their positions more readily in these situations if the company faces important ESG risks and does not show strong willingness to change and engage with their minority shareholders. 
Thirdly, what are shareholders' history of engagement with the company? So not just your own, what's happened before? If you take the example of ExxonMobil, one of the largest oil and gas companies in the world with a very poor track record on climate, almost everything in the shareholders' toolbox has already been tried. That includes private engagements, AGM statements, the filing of shareholder resolutions, the passing of a shareholder resolution, investors pre-declaring their voting intentions, campaigns to vote against board members, and a successful campaign to get new directors voted in. But the result of all of these actions has been very limited. When it comes to scope three, I don't think we've noticed any material changes. So in my perspective, it would be slightly naive to think that further engagement will finally tip the balance. And then finally, how will your ask resonate with others? How do other investors feel about the company that you're engaging with? Um, let me illustrate that final one with an example, which is an engagement that Share Action coordinated between investors and HSBC. We had been engaging with the bank for many, many years on um, its lack of a core phase act commitment um, and on its lukewarm core policy. We, had, we weren't alone. We had been working with key investors in its shareholder base. Civil society has also raised concern about HSBC's core policy. But the bank, despite all this, refused to budge. And the, in the autumn of 2020, um, HSBC announced a commitment to net zero by 2050, following Barclays' own commitment earlier that year. But the issue is that they omitted saying anything about coal. And the interesting thing that happened is that the response from shareholders to HSBC's commitment, including Aviva investors, Eden Tree Investment Management and others, was net zero is all well and good, but what are you going to do on call? And so that's where the idea of a resolution came from. So here at Share Action, we reached out to the investors that we had been working with to test the idea of a resolution. And we ended up coordinating a powerful coalition of 15 investors representing 2.4 trillion in assets and including Amundi, Academic Pension, Man Group and others. The good thing was that the bank was terrified um, of the idea of the resolution going to a vote and tough negotiations happen in the months following the filing of a resolution. So that shows that collaborative engagement can really yield results because um, it can bring companies to the negotiation table. Some external factors that strengthen our hand, including the fact, included the fact that the bank was lagging behind many of its peers, that the media was extremely interested in the story, but also that um, other investors were conducting their own bilateral engagements with the bank and were amplifying the asks that we were making in their own individual engagement. All of this led the bank to concede on a number of asks that we had been making and many in the investment community had been making for years, including um, the need for the bank to phase up from call and update key aspects of its call policy. And we decided to withdraw our resolution to recognize the bank's progress. And I guess I share that example because I think it's quite a nice example that shows the power that collaborative engagement can have, especially when it's supported by investors um, doing their own individual engagement with the same company. What I think it also illustrates is how powerful investors can be when they enter unlikely alliances and are ready, are courageous enough to partner with unlikely organizations such as NGOs like Share Action, but also investors that are much smaller or much bigger. Uh, than them or based in a completely different market. Thank you so much. Yes, in fact, uh, lots of uh, information there on different ways, on different levers, actually, and different questions that need to be asked in order um, to maximize chances of the engagement being successful. Um, Sophie, let me turn to you. Um, so in your daily practice, what are some of the things you put in place from, you know, how you identify opportunities where engagement makes sense um, through to your process? What are the things that you do? Um, what are the key success? factors for you in order to to maximize the potential of an engagement um, getting you to the goals to the targets that you've set yes thank you mary um yes to to rebound on what uh, what jean just said indeed we we cannot engage with all the companies and we have no uh, uh one for all huge solutions so um we prioritize, of course, based on our asset under management uh, within, the, within the companies. We look also at um, 
the concrete leverage we have, percentage of market cap, percentage of debt. Uh, we consider also um, what if uh, if this is if it would be not too naive to think that the company uh, uh, may evolve uh, uh, or not, if we can measure the impact of our engagement, because it's really important to document the engagement and to report on it, because if not, it could be considered uh, partly as greenwashing also uh, from, uh, from other stakeholders. Uh, so definitely our power of influence is um, is uh, is the is part of the key factors we are looking at to to prioritize uh, engagement. Uh, I would mention uh, an another one. It's the momentum because indeed, as investors, we have leverage, but regulators have leverage, customers have leverage, uh, civil society has leverage, and when there is the right momentum. I mean, when all these different stakeholders push in the same direction, uh, 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 corporate, or it can, it could be, it could be a state uh, uh, too. Um, then it's the right momentum to to act. But the ability to detect this momentum, it means it means that uh, internally on our side, uh, we know very well the whole ecosystem of uh, of uh, the uh, the issuer and uh, indeed we have the internal expertise and it means uh, a mix of uh, financial esg expertise to to detect this uh, this this right mo this right momentum uh, talking about um, uh, success factors indeed uh, we have here uh, in in this talk a focus on the climate crisis it means that we engage for change. Um, human being is reluctant to change. Uh, if you add um, external factors like uh, geopolitical factors, economic uh, uh, situation, difficult economic situation, of course, uh, it will it will demand a lot of efforts. So, of course, we will privilege collaborative initiative because uh, we will have more, uh, more, more leverage, we will be more powerful. But on the other side, uh, we must say that uh, we need to limit the, let's say, the administrative red tape of collaborative initiative, because uh, sometimes it's really heavy, it's not uh, agile enough. And here it's, uh, we, it's urgent to, to act for, for for climate, so sometimes it's uh, in our experience, it's also uh, more efficient to um, to go into smaller size uh, collaborative initiative that will be more flexible. And uh, in that also, I consider the fact that to be successful, a collaborative initiative means that all the people around the t table know them well, that they trust themselves, because even if we act collaboratively. Um, we are responsible individually of our choice of investment of escalation and when you act collaboratively it means that you you need to go very far with one voice to be able to be firm to be as firm as possible and together uh, till uh, till the end uh, uh, of the dialogue till uh, you, you reach the objective and that's also a difficult part because we are all different as uh, as investors Thank you so much for very interesting insights. I want to turn back a little bit to the question of divestments and exclusions and how as investors we can structure an approach to um, exclusions and exclusion policy or divestment strategy that makes sense. Um, Pierre, how have you approached that at EHAF? Is it as simple as just excluding certain sectors completely or uh, excluding certain so-called sin stocks or is it more nuanced than that? Yes, I think that, that's, a, that's a good question. And coming back to my first point, I think here we have to differentiate whether it's a, um, an exclusion that is, as we've mentioned here, um, uh, make to, to, to be the final step and to drive changes uh, at companies. And that requires a, a much more nuanced uh, approach. And I will come back to that in a second. Um, of course, if it's something um, more on the value-based that, that can be... Um, uh, more radical or, or more, um, at least, uh, 
yeah, uh, on, on, on everything. Uh, but coming back to, to the point we were talking about here is, which is on, on with a view to, 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 to drive changes at, at companies. Um, indeed, I think it, it requires nuance and I think I, I, I could go on for, for, for quite some time on this topic, but just, just to, ki to give a few um, things to consider. Um, first of all, um, wh when you decide to exclude um, a stock or a sector or something, um, it can be dif differentiated whether you exclude it from your uh, equity portfolio or your debt portfolio. Um, and with that also, whether you, you exclude it from the stock, everything that you own, or whether it's on new investments only. And I think that that may be uh, especially relevant for a debt investment, uh, because when you hold a debt, it's already been financed, so you have less of a leverage. But if you stop financing new debt, uh, that will finance new projects uh, that can be, uh, yeah, that can be very, very um, uh, impactful uh, in terms of new projects. And I'm thinking here, for instance, on, on oil and gas uh, projects that, that, that require uh, new, new, new cash. Um, it can also be uh, to give time to companies, as we've said, to to accompany them in, the, for instance, in the transition, it can be it it's, it will send a strong signal uh, if you say today, okay, by uh, 2025 or by X date, uh, we will stop um, financing companies that don't meet these criteria. So that's uh, also a, a, a temporal factor, and and to my point also was defining criteria um, on, 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 the, on the activities or things like that. So um, we all know, for instance, of the percentage of, uh, of revenues. So that could be only companies that derive a large uh, uh, proportion from, uh, of their revenues from, from a certain activity. And I think that um, that's quite relevant. And even when we're talking about something as coal, which kind of everyone agrees that we need to get rid of coal, but there are a lot of lots of companies that have a marginal exposure to coal uh, that are phasing out of coal. So um, actually excluding these companies could actually be a, a wrong signal to them, um, or it would lead you to, to exclude some, uh, for instance, industrial companies that have just a little bit of, of coal on their operations, uh, which is not the, the, where the, the, the main um, uh, challenges. So having thresholds, or it could be uh, companies that are still developing activities uh, again can, can be coal, it can be um, oil and gas company. Uh, the so the internal international um, energy agency has said that there should be no new new uh, post 2021 uh, oil and gas fields uh, developed. So uh, it can incorporate something like that. And uh, finally, also, um, um, so we've talked a lot about exclusions here, but. Uh, there, there could be exceptions to these exclusions, um, and so, for instance, one that uh, we've we've done internally at Terraf is uh, on the call. We we have a global phase out um, uh, date as uh, as uh, numerous uh, international institutions have recommended. So by 2030 in uh, in OECD countries and by 2040 globally, um, and so there will be exclusions for company exceptions, sorry, exceptions to exclusion for companies that are within this uh, exit date. Um, so that's what that's uh, one possibility. Or or if we're talking about debt again, uh, it can be the green bonds that are financed to a specific project. Um, or yeah, there, there could be many um, uh, criteria. So what basically my message here is um, when uh, it could it should be a general approach and when it comes to um, divesting the decision has been made uh, think carefully how um, how to design uh, these exclusions and also what signals uh, it sends uh, to companies mm -hmm. yeah. yes thank you so much and actually you already mentioned um, exclusions pertaining specifically to emission intensive sectors and actually let me stay with you on that theme and zoom into your climate strategy um, how have you integrated climate into your overall investment strategy and how do you use those tools um, dialogue voting divestment to achieve the goals you have set with regards to climate um, related uh, matters and then also very importantly how do you assess um, your strategy against those objectives how do you measure the results of your um, activities um, with regards to the climate related impact you want to have 
that's uh, that's a difficult one but uh, yes let, let, let's try to to answer um so first of all i think um as that was mentioned before uh divestment and engagement are pieces of one big uh block of, of a, a, a strategy to to have an impact um so i would and it can be a bit um uh discouraging to, to look at something first if you haven't been in, in details in, into this topic so uh, what we've done at, at uh, ERAF was um when we decided to to strengthen our climate engagement um to join uh, an alliance in our case it's the net zero asset owner alliance uh, but it can be uh, there are a number of uh, others on the asset managers the banking the insurance um and these alliances are are really um helpful in um, providing uh, methodologies and, and guidelines on how to um, how to uh, um, to define these objectives and what what these should be. Um, so to take the, the example of uh, the Net Zero Asset Manager uh, Alliance, they have uh, defined th four uh, pillars, uh, four kinds of of, uh, uh, of topics. Uh, so the first one is um, an objective on the a portfolio uh, carbon intensity, um, so very very aggregated uh, measure, um, and then a sectoral um, uh, target uh, that uh, essentially is the same, but um, with a um, physical uh, KPI at the denominator. So, for instance, you would be looking at uh, the carbon intensity of electricity production. If you're looking at electricity or or the, the carbon intensity of a ton of steel or, or cement or something like that. Uh, so that, that the first the first two. Um, the third one, obviously, we, we've talked about, uh, about a lot about it, is on the engagement, uh, both with asset managers, uh, regulators, and obviously uh, companies. And the last one um, is about the, the financing. So I think that's something we haven't touched on, touched on yet. Um, but that as an asset, especially as an asset uh, owner, it's, it's really relevant to direct capital to companies uh, that need to play a role. And, and I'll come, to, come back to that later. But uh, I think it's very important when you think of climate, um, not to think only of one KPI, uh, and it's it's obviously much more complicated than that. But um, for instance, relying too much on um, carbon intensity or even temperature that it, that can be a bit better um, will um, uh, disadvantage uh, com some companies that can be very carbon intense, um, but that provide solutions uh, to, to the transition. I'm thinking, for instance, here of utilities or material companies. Um, so, yeah, so, so, so having different boxes enables you to, um, while pursuing a certain objective and carbon uh, intensity reduction is a good thing, but having different pockets enables you yeah, to, to capture these this different um, uh, facets. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop here for the first question because and, and touch on very quickly on, on the second one that you mentioned on evaluating um, the, the results. Uh, obviously, the more KPIs you have, the, the, the more challenging it is. Um, and maybe two, two comments. Um, one uh, on something that is more quantitative. Um, it's important when, when you look at your portfolio um, for instance, and most of us look at carbon intensity uh, as a first instance, um, is whether uh, the evolution is driven by uh, either a change in allocation, um, a change in the financial denominators, for instance, revenues or, or, or market capitalization, or if it's indeed uh, in real life uh, GHG emissions from the companies, which is what we want to achieve. But, um, but yeah, it needs to be a uh, decomposed uh, to, to to make sure uh, what we do is is really having an impact, and and perhaps the last point on uh, evaluating the, the the results of engagement. Unfortunately, we don't have a, a perfect solution. That that would be nice, um, but uh, it, it has to go through um, a very qualitative uh, assessment, and that's uh, for instance what Jan touched on uh, a few. Um, uh, examples of uh, of uh, changes. I think we, we have to to be um, quite humble in in uh, in the way we we act. Um, that's also what what Sophie was uh, uh, alluding to. It's not just us that have an impact on companies. It's obviously uh, regulators, uh, civil society, consumers, and so on. Um, but nevertheless, uh, in in some instances. Uh, we can definitely see an impact, and, and uh, in case of resolutions, of course, it's it's sometimes much 
more direct uh, when, when you see, for instance, HSBC publishing a call uh, position just after a, a resolution uh, uh, withdrawn on that topic, that's, that's easier. Uh, but even if it's not the case, um, it's, it, it's really more of a, of a qualitative assessment. And that's we can do as an asset owner. Obviously, it's more, it's more difficult when, when you're an asset manager that distributes um, uh, your, your funds uh, to, to, to the wider audience. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we, we have to keep in mind that um, it is a collective effort. Uh, and the important thing is perhaps to see how, um, how these topics are addressed within the companies, the, the time that is spent, the, um, the, the, the expertise that is, that is developed in-house, uh, because it, it's not possible to say, okay, Condoriam has done this on their own. And it's probably not the case, but it contributes to, uh, to something. So. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, so, Jean, I want to turn to you and take a little bit of a bird's eye view uh, from your perspective, um, looking kind of across what's happening currently in terms of climate action, what's being taken. Um, what do you see as the key trends and developments and most importantly, what's working right now in effecting change on the climate crisis? Thank you. Um, I would say the first thing to say is it's actually quite hard to uh, identify trends and evolution because transparency continues to be an issue. And Pierre was talking about quantitative assessments and kind of reporting on the engagements that ERAF are leading or contributing to. The issue is that in the asset management sector, a lot of asset managers continue not to report on the engagements that they're having with companies. And um, in the survey that I mentioned earlier, we found that less than half of them publish quantitative assessments of the engagements they had run, and even less uh, published a list of the companies that they engage with. So that's quite problematic because, you know, if you are a pension fund with a net zero ambition, there's lots of actions that you can do yourselves, but you're also dependent on your manager um, to be able to meet your net zero ambition. But if you have no transparency on what your manager is actually doing on your behalf, that puts you in a really tricky situation. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, that being said, of the managers that did report on their engagements, um, we identified a positive trend, which is that um, most of these managers focused on companies' decarbonization, decarbonization strategies, so their emission reduction targets, their net zero ambition, et cetera, as their top engagement um, topic. And that is a shift from 2020, because at the time, climate disclosures were the top uh, climate related engagement priority of asset managers. And it's now a manager's second priority, followed by climate governance. So that increased focus on action oriented commitments as opposed to disclosures is welcome. Um, however, I do want to end with a more positive note, which is that at the institution level, we have seen a number of high profile engagements that have shifted norms in the industry and all led to material changes in companies' business strategies. And I'll mention two brief examples. The first one being a large coalition of 35 investors representing seven trillion in assets and including uh, Candram, coincidentally, having set their eyes on the European chemical sector. And I think that's quite an interesting engagement because the chemical sector is a lot less sexy than other sectors, such as the fossil fuel sector. And those companies perhaps aren't used to being put in the spotlight for their decarbon decarbonization strategies. And that's kind of the strength of that engagement. And those investors have already had some impacts on the climate strategies of chemical companies. An example is um, the engagement they've had with Leondel Basel, which led the, com the company to set science-based targets. A second more recent um, example is the engagement they've been having with um, Swiss chemicals company EMS Chemi, with investors such as Swedish pension fund AP7 and the UK's largest asset manager Elgym, amongst others, voting against the re-election of the company's chair for climate reasons and making their intention known ahead of the AGM. And I think that's really interesting because across the board, we are seeing more and more investors willing to pre-declare their voting intention, both on resolutions, but also on director re-elections. The second uh, example that I'll mention 
is a small group of progressive pension funds and asset managers that have been publicly calling on large European banks to cease financing for new oil and gas. Again, that engagement has had impacts, notably at BNP Paribas and Societe Generale in the last couple of months. But I think that is also an interesting engagement because too large a portion of the investment industry remains reluctant to publicly call for an end to oil and gas exploration and new developments, despite this being a core aspect of any um, 1.5 degree scenario. And I think that second example shows that in some cases, you actually don't need everyone on board to be able to have impact. You just need that group of committed individuals that are focused on that engagement and agree on the final outcome. So I guess to summarize, we've seen some progress in the industry. Transparency remains uh, a problem. Um, progress has been too lukewarm, um, but you know um, we've we've definitely identified pockets of progress uh, which have had material impacts on companies' climate strategies. Thank you so much, Jeanne. So quite a complex environment, a lot of challenges still ahead of us. Um, Pierre, as an asset owner, you work with asset managers um, that for you carry out engagement activities. Um, what kind of um, criteria factors do you look at then in your um, asset manager selection um, when it comes to their resources, their processes in the engagement space? And does that vary depending on what kind of strategy you use that asset manager for? Yeah, um, yeah, I think that's that's a, a good point because we can't do everything ourselves, obviously. So I think what we will focus at as an asset owner is, uh, as you rightly mentioned, first of all, the, the capabilities. Um, so just the, for instance, the, the number of, of people in the in the SRI team or the engagement team, um, and also their level of experience, um, uh, and also. The, the level of, of decision, um, the seniority within the organization. Uh, so, so I think that's that's uh, an important point. And as we touched on earlier, um, simply asking for a reporting um, on on the on the um, on the engagements that are conducted. So that's something we do quantitatively, and we ask within the mandate. We ask that uh, asset managers report on on what they've done. Uh, so because that's that's a way to try to to. To follow and also a, a positive signal and it gets them used to, to reporting a, a, as a whole um, and perhaps also to, to your last point i think is um we are asking different things whether it's an active uh, managers that uh, actively selects company to invest in uh, we also have uh, as uh, most uh, investors uh, passive mandates of uh, index tracking and on these ones we would follow more, uh, uh, put more emphasis on, on the voting. Um, so because we've lot, talked a lot about engagement, but uh, voting is also uh, or is embedded into into engagement, and it's it's, it's really a core uh, part. So on these ones, we would ask um, uh, our asset managers to apply uh, the, our own uh, voting policy. And again, what we will look at in, in this instance is um, the. the the, the capabilities of the team to analyze resolutions that are put because it's a lot of work. Uh, everybody that, that is involved knows that. Uh, um, so again, uh, capabilities and and and, uh, and possibility to to follow um, dedicated uh, guidelines and, and reporting. Thank you so much. Yes, um, so definitely also a call on asset managers for enhanced transparency, enhanced reporting on their engagement activities uh, for asset owners to be able to take informed um, invest decisions when it comes to asset manager selection too. Um, I wanna now um, look a little bit towards the future. Um, if you're looking forward, what kinds of evolutions or changes would you like to see, be it in regulation, in practices, um, to facilitate engagement um, activities in the future? Uh, Jeanne, let me start with you. Great. Um, I think a lot uh, can happen, um, but I'll I'll flag three key things. The first thing is here at Chair Action, we think we need better and stronger regulation of the financial sector and other high carbon sectors. So some of the things that we've been pushing for at the UK and EU level include mandating climate transition plans with um, nature at their core for financial institutions, an updated definition of fiduciary duty, and the introduction of fossil fuel capital requirements for banks and insurers, amongst other things. The second thing is that sadly, 
British NGO Finance Map has, has shown that many financial institutions stand in the way of um, governments implementing more ambitious climate legislation. We think that all financial institutions should align their lobbying activities, both direct and indirect, with their net zero ambitions. And thirdly, I think financial institutions should recognize that there's an increased interest from beneficiaries and customers in how their money is being spent. Um, here at Show Action, we recently commissioned um, a poll of 2000 British adults on their views on the financial institutions that they were using and how their money should be spent. And what we found is that an overwhelming majority of, of people um, would have a more negative view of their financial provider if they knew that provider invested in companies that breached labor rights standards for their workers, um, were involved in deforestation or damaging the environment. So I think this increased awareness might translate into rising reputational and financial risk for financial institutions that continue to be asleep at the wheel when it comes to tackling the climate crisis and other issues. Right, absolutely. So some a matter not only for, for asset owners and asset managers, but it's broader than that. Um, Pierre, how about you looking forward? What kind of changes are you hoping for? Would you like to see? Yeah, I think I would mention three uh, briefly. First of all, as as Shan mentioned, I would echo the the, the regulatory uh, changes, uh, and and perhaps um, in the case of France, what what we're struggling with is, for instance, the difficulty to uh, to file resolutions. Uh, so first of all, in terms of uh, really administra administrative work, and also the the share of capital that is required uh, is is quite important. So um, a flexibility around 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 this point uh, would be welcome, as we see, for instance, in the US, where much more resolutions uh, can, can be filed. Um, and also on the content of it. Uh, so for instance, we, we, we haven't mentioned it yet, but um, we, we're seeing now the development on say on climate uh, resolutions. So really to uh, on the, the, comp the company uh, climate strategy, but these are very uh, narrow in, in what they can uh, contain. So clarification from from the regulator on that point uh, would be uh, would be much uh, welcome, and there are quite a number of, of um, discussions with the government and, and the uh, in investors uh, on on that topic. So I hope that that uh, continues. Um, a second point I would mention is. It has already been said, uh, but really the coordination between all parties. Um, so I think for us, collaborative engagement is the right um, uh, way to, to to pursue engagement. Also, it was a question on on if everybody if everybody does engagement, it's overwhelming uh, companies. So I think it makes sense uh, to, to 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 gather, uh, but not only within investors, and that's what Jan was saying uh, on on all the, the civil society and so on. So that would be my my second. Um, um, uh, thing that I would like to see is more coordination between NGOs, investors, regulators, and, and uh, consumers. And the last point uh, I would like to make is on um, perhaps more on the investor side uh, of a more institutionalized way of, of uh, conducting engagement. Uh, I think before it was um, kind of tries here and there uh, by, by people, by investors, how, how to be effective. And now we are we're starting to see uh, for instance, academic research on, on, on the topic um, and, and better structure within international uh, coalitions, uh, in, uh, engagement coalitions, for instance. So that's uh, one uh, positive uh, outcome, I think, is it's becoming more of um, uh, more something institutionalized and, and we know better how to be effective. So I would I could only encourage um, uh, actors in developing these uh, skills, actually. Thank you, Pierre. And, and Sophie, from your perspective, on a daily basis, you engage with companies. Uh, what would you like to see for the future? I think that what I would like to see is uh, less polarization of uh, the debate, because uh, as a practitioner of uh, engagement, what we see is increased tension uh, within the room when we discuss with uh, with uh, with corporates, and uh, if uh, we want to be productive, if we want to be efficient, if we want to tackle this uh, uh, this climate uh, crisis, then it requires mutual respect and understanding of uh, the the respective challenge we face, and uh, also it it uh, corporate also need to to understand that we are mandated by our client that most of them 
once returned, but not at the expense of uh, environmental or, or social factors, that we have regulatory constraints too. And uh, that we have also to, uh, taken commitment like um, uh, for us is a net zero uh, asset management um, initiative. So um, reduce polarization of uh, the debate is a necessity. I was talking about tension within the room with the corporate, but we need really to pay attention also at, at what is happening outside the room because tension is also increasing, for instance, between investors. Uh, this, uh, that was this year during uh, the voting season. Um, uh, Climate-related uh, questions uh, asked by uh, institutionals uh, via share action uh, actually were booed by um, uh, shareholders, uh, minority shareholders, individual shareholders who were in the room. And that means also that we must really better communicate on the, on. I think you lost me a while. Uh, we must better communicate, and uh, indeed, we 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 need to to communicate on the structured approach uh, we have uh, uh, on on engagement. And last thing I see is that we engage with cor with corporates, but transition will not happen if it's not just transition. And uh, it means also that government states have a really important role to play in this. And it means that engagement on the credit side uh, will, also, uh, will also increase. Yes, thank you so much. And actually, um, Pierre and Sophie, you've um, actually already answered one of the questions we got in our chat. Uh, one of uh, our viewers was asking about the company's perspective, the investee company's perspective, and how investor relation departments can deal with increased demand from investors, from asset owners. And the points you made, I think, are very important here. Um, communication, uh, mutual understanding um, as well from the asset uh, owner um, and investor, a better understanding of uh, company's perspective perspective, but then companies' perspectives as well, um, having to increase the understanding of, of end investors um, and consumers' um, requirements. And then, of course, also this aspect of professionalization and emphasis on collaborative initiative as being one way to also facilitate um, communication with investor relations department and maybe especially those at small and mid companies that might not have as, as many resources. Um, I want to take um, another question question from um, the chat actually which echoes something that you were just saying Sophie um, which is about sovereign engagement so we've spoken a lot about corporate engagement today actually we've focused on that um, primarily um, Sophie what you, you mentioned about the importance of also engaging with countries um, countries setting the overall environment for companies to operate in as well what are some of the key differences between engaging with a corporate versus with a sovereign um, it's more difficult to find the right interlocutor uh, with sovereign. Uh, of course, our leverage is fully different, even if uh, we, it's leg our demands are uh, legitimate. But you see, okay, POI recently launched an, an initiative uh, with, uh, with Australia, uh, but uh, you have also other engagement initiatives like uh, investor um, policy dialogue on dialogue on uh, deforestation that uh, has existed for, for a while. Um, if uh, we, we don't insist on the fact that uh, countries need new uh, infrastructure, greener infrastructure, uh, um, uh, that government must encourage a relocation of uh, industry, promote uh, education for this uh, uh, relocated industry, uh, we, we, we won't have any success. So it's difficult to engage with state, with state but they are not as reluctant as uh, we, we could imagine because what they must finance this uh, transition. And uh, that's where we find a common um, uh, ground of, uh, of discussion because green bonds, sustainable bonds, are a way to finance this uh, this transition, and responsible investors uh, are uh, <laughs> are really pleased to see uh, to see the trend of uh, growing uh, green and sustainable bonds. So, it's it's something really positive. Uh, I consider I, uh, it as really positive. Fantastic, thanks, and it's great to to end on a positive note as well. Um, we are um, almost um, out of time. Um, 
should your questions um, not have been answered or should you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to um, reach out to us um, after this uh, webinar and we'll try to answer your question to the best of our abilities with our um, uh, panelists. Um, um, also, should you be interested in um, learning a bit more about sustainable investing in general, including engagement, please don't hesitate to check out the Kandriam Academy, which is a um, research-based accredited um, resource for training on sustainable investing. Um, and I just want to um, close out this call by asking our three panelists to just share three. Should we maybe take over? Um... I think Mahi was going to ask us to share three keywords um, that uh, listeners can take with them and keep in mind when it comes to engagement, voting and divestment. Um, Sophie, do you want to start? Okay, thank you. So I would say partnership, I would say ambitious, and I would say inclusive. Thank you. So uh, Jeanne and Pierre, have you already shared your key um, takeaways? I, I was disconnected for a bit. I'll share one sentence instead of three words, but my advice is to be ready to feel uncomfortable because if you're too comfortable, you're unlikely to be making change. What about you, Pierre? Well, thank you. That, that's a great one. Uh, I think for me, the, the, the three ones would be a holistic approach, uh, the coordination. Perhaps something we haven't touched on really is uh, biodiversity uh, because climate is one piece uh, of, of, of a broader uh, nature and environment and biodiversity issue. So um, also put that into a, into a wider context uh, of not just climate. Fantastic. So on that note and those key t takeaways, I would like to thank our three panelists very much uh, for being with us today and um, sharing their perspectives. I hope it was interesting um, for all of you. And again, should you have any comments or questions, um, please don't hesitate to, to get in touch and we'd be happy to follow up with you directly on this very important topic. Thank you very much and have a good day.